identity in Christ. That is our theme for our evening services over these weeks. All of us who belong to Jesus have the most amazing identity. Many wonderful biblical terms for us highlight this thrilling truth. On our last two Sabbath evenings, we focused on how in Christ we are children of God Most High. Born of the Spirit, we are sons and daughters of the King of Heaven. What an incredible identity to be a child cherished by our Creator God and cared for by our loving Heavenly Father. This evening, we'll reflect on another biblical term which highlights our incredible identity in Jesus. In his word, our Lord calls us his servants. As his sons and daughters, we're also servants of the living God. Now, this comes across clearly throughout the New Testament. At the start of his letter to the Christians at Rome, the Apostle Paul describes himself in this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Note how Paul spoke of himself as a servant before he mentioned that he was an apostle. Peter, in 1 Peter 2.16, calls all Christians to live as servants of God. Therefore, Scripture is clear. When we are born of the Spirit, Jesus becomes our master. And so every Christian is to live as a servant of Christ. In the first century, the term servant was a very powerful term and filled with enormous meaning. The Greek word for servant is doulos. Well, the moment someone in the first century heard the word doulos, all sorts of vivid imageries, images flooded into his mind, far more than would come into our minds today. For how many of us here have servants at home or have even met servants? None of us, I imagine. And so few of us, I imagine, have any personal experience of people we know being servants. We hear on the news of the global underground slave trade, but the vast majority of people have no personal experience of it. And therefore, in our modern 21st century Western world, the word servant doesn't mean a lot to us. It probably just conjures up images of servants in TV period dramas. But in the first century, friends, the term servant was a very evocative and relevant word. For doulos didn't just mean servant, it meant slave. And there were thousands upon thousands of slaves across the Roman Empire. And so everyone knew a lot about slaves from personal experience. If they didn't have slaves themselves, they would have known others who had them, or perhaps they were slaves themselves. In certain places, owners actually had the power of life and death over their slaves. These owners could decide which slaves should live and which slaves should die. So plainly, slaves had very few rights in the first century, or even no rights whatsoever. And if their master was unkind, their life was, was one of drudgery and toil. But not all masters were cruel and bad. Some masters were kind and fair, and their slaves could enjoy a life of privilege and education. Yet every slave was owned by their master. Every slave was part of his property. Every slave belonged to his master just as much as his furniture or his animals. And so in the first century, the term servant conjured up all sorts of vivid, poignant imagery about slavery. Well, it's this word doulos, meaning servant stroke slave, which Paul and Peter used to describe a Christian. They wrote of Christ the Master and of Christians as his slaves. What a powerful and startling picture. Well, it's this potent picture we're going to think about this evening 
And there are three key points I want us to focus on in particular as we consider our call to be Christ's servants and slaves. Let's think first of all about the privilege of being God's servant. The privilege of being a servant of Christ the King. Turn with me please in your Bible to Romans 6 verse 22. Throughout his letter to the Romans, Paul highlights just what the gospel of God is all about. Well, in Romans 6, verse 22, Paul writes, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. What Paul describes here is a picture that everyone in the first century would have been familiar with. For with his words, Paul paints the picture of a slave market. Just imagine for a moment, a man who's been put up for sale. This man is a slave, but his owner is selling him. Well, the moment the hammer bangs down to confirm the sale, the man is somebody else's slave. He's now the property of his new owner. Well, Paul tells us here that this is what happens at Christian conversion. This is what takes place when someone is converted to Christ. Christian friend, before you were converted, you were in slavery. You were a slave to your sin. You were mastered by your sinful nature. You weren't your own. It was your sinful nature that was running and dominating your life. But at your conversion to Christ, the wonder of wonders took place. For at conversion, you were bought by Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ himself bought you. And so now as a Christian, you've a new master. You're no longer to be ruled by your old master. Your sinful nature is no longer to have mastery over you. You're now to be ruled by your new master, Jesus. And so do you see, sin has lost its hold on you. Sin has lost its control of you. You're now gloriously free by the help of the Spirit to say no to sin and yes to what is right. You're now able to flee from temptation and to say yes to what your new master wants. Christian friends, what a blessing. We no longer live under the dominance of our sinful natures. We're now under the lordship of our loving Saviour. Our evil enemy Satan rules us no more. Our gracious King Jesus now reigns over us. My fellow believers, there is nothing like this liberation that we have experienced. There is no other freedom like it in the world. This is the freedom of all freedoms. On news reports, we sometimes see footage of prisoners walking free from their prisons after a long sentence. I'll never forget watching TV coverage of the freeing of Nelson Mandela after all those years behind bars. What an incredible feeling for Mandela. What a liberation for him to experience. And what a glorious sight for his supporters to see their champion take his first steps to freedom. It must have been the most wonderful yet surreal moment in Mandela's life to walk free having been incarcerated for so many years. But Christian friends, as wonderful as such liberation is, Mandela's release could never compare for a moment with the wonder of your liberation in Christ. For you haven't simply experienced a physical liberation. You've been blessed with an inner spiritual liberation. You've been set free from the tyranny of your sin and from your arch enemy Satan. You've been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light. And your freedom isn't just for this life. You've been freed forever. What blessing to be a servant of the King of Kings. For Jesus is the ultimate master. King Jesus is the master of all masters. The master of perfect love and amazing grace. King Jesus is the master who is perfectly fair and just. And so King Jesus is the most wonderful master you could ever serve. My Christian friend, are you truly thankful that you are no longer under the mastery of your sin and of Satan? 
Are you thrilled that you're now serving the most gracious, glorious master possible? Do you rejoice that you are one of his servants? You're free to serve the King of Kings. You're free to become the person God created you to be. What a colossal change between living for your sinful self and living for your sinless saviour. And what a dramatic difference in outcome. Living for our sinful natures leads us to eternal death and everlasting condemnation in hell. Living for our gracious saviour by the enabling of the spirit brings us eternal life and everlasting joy and ultimately to the glory of heaven. And so the privilege of being a servant of God is unspeakably glorious. But let's think secondly of the price of becoming God's servants. Having thought about the privilege, we're going to think about the price of becoming God's servants. We could never have paid the debt for all our sin. We could never have bought freedom from our old master's sin and Satan. But what we were powerless to do for ourselves, Christ did it all for us. Our Saviour paid the price for our redemption in full. What did it cost Jesus to rescue you and me from eternal ruin? What price did God's Son pay to redeem us from our old masters of sin and Satan? Well, firstly, Jesus Christ lived the life of perfect obedience that we could never have lived because of our sinful natures. And then secondly, Jesus suffered the horror of hell upon the cross of Calvary in our place to pay the penalty for our mountain of debt to God. And so it wasn't with perishable things like silver or gold that we were, we were redeemed from our empty way of life. It was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish or defect. 1 Peter 1 verse 18. What a price Christ paid to redeem us. It couldn't have been any costlier for God's Son, your Saviour. Jesus Christ gave his all to secure your freedom and mine. Our Saviour laid down his very life to redeem you and me. And so we are not our own, for we've been bought at the highest possible price. May we appreciate more and more how much it cost our precious Redeemer as he suffered on our behalf. Jesus Christ took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Our Deliverer was pierced for our transgressions and crushed. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that bought us peace was upon him as our substitute. It was by his wounds that we are healed. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Our Saviour was cut off from the land of the living. Our Redeemer was stricken for our transgression. It was the Lord's will to crush his son and to cause him to suffer the horrors of hell and to make his life a guilt offering for you and me. The incalculable price for your freedom and mine, the phenomenal price our Saviour paid for us to become God's servants. Well, we've reflected on the privilege of being God's servants and the price that Jesus paid for us to become God's servants. We're going to think in a moment, thirdly, about the marks. Of We've reflected on the privilege of being God's servants and the price that Jesus paid for us to become God's servants. Thirdly and finally, let's think about the marks of God's servants. What marks do we see in true servants of God? Well, at this point, we need to remember the vital words of Jesus in Luke 12, verse 48. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. 
Well, in making us his servants, God has given you and me so, so, so much. God has granted us such an amazing liberty. We've experienced such a glorious freedom. And so God now expects much from us. He commands us to be his faithful, fruitful servants. This is the key way to demonstrate that we're truly grateful to him for redeeming us and calling us into his family, making us his servants. We're to live every day of our lives as good servants of Christ. The Bible tells us about many great servants of God, Paul and Peter, two really high profile servants of Christ, spring to mind immediately. But this evening, I want to focus on a disciple who wasn't as prominent as Paul and Peter in the early church. I want us to consider Barnabas, a great example as a servant of the Lord. Barnabas glorified the Lord and was a wonderful blessing to many. Let's reflect on our responsibilities as servants of Christ as we look at Barnabas and his inspiring example. We read together five short episodes in the life of the early church in which Barnabas features. These episodes highlight the marks of a servant of Christ. Firstly, they show us how Barnabas was self-denying. He was self-denying. He was a guy who forgot about himself because his focus was on Jesus Christ and on serving his Saviour. Barnabas' life was all about living for his Lord. Barnabas was out to please his master in everything. He sought to serve his king, not his own selfish ends. Barnabas determined to obey Christ, even when it was very costly, saying no to himself and yes to the Lord. In each of the five episodes, we see Barnabas was no longer living for himself, but for the one who meant everything to him. And so Barnabas demonstrated what is at the very heart of being a real servant of Christ. And we know that Jesus openly declared very directly in Mark 8, 34, what it is. Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so Jesus points out in no uncertain terms what we must be prepared for to be his true servants. Note how Jesus spoke of people coming after him. Whoever will come after me, Jesus said. To come after Jesus actually means to attach yourself to Jesus as his disciple. When Jesus was on earth, multitudes swarmed after Jesus as he moved from place to place. But a great number of those crowds, they never attached themselves to Jesus because so many of them were just looking for miracles and for physical food, and they weren't willing to deny themselves. They weren't ready to leave their own ambitions behind. Friends, what Jesus Christ calls for is revolutionary. God's Son demands a radical denunciation of yourself. And Barnabas was prepared for this. What about you tonight? All of us who love Christ are born of his Spirit, and his Spirit indwells us day by day. But our sinful natures are still alive and kicking within us, and they want to have their own way day by day. And they make us think instinctively of pleasing ourselves rather than pleasing the Lord. And so naturally, you and I would rather say yes to our plans and no to God's. All of this comes as second nature to us because we're born self-centered rather than God-centered. But God is out to change that in you and me. Indeed, the Lord is out to cause a revolution in our lives. Our new master is out to transform us from being self-centered sinners into Christ-centered servants. If you're to be a true servant of Christ, you must be prepared for this revolution, my friend. You need to be willing for this colossal change that the Spirit intends to bring about in you. Of course, this is not fashionable in our generation. We live in an age of self-indulgence. We live in a society which constantly urges us to pamper ourselves, 
The priority of most today, all around us in Belfast and across our country, is to look after number one. I can do my own thing. I can live life my own way. I don't need to think about God and his demands or Christ and his claims on me. That's what the vast majority of our fellow men say tonight. If not with their lips, then with their lives, with how they are living day by day. And this attitude even grips many in evangelical churches. Even many who profess to be born again are falling into this trap. What about you, my friend? Are you being a Barnabas? Are you denying yourself daily and following Christ? Attaching yourself to him, cleaving to him. This is essential if you're truly to serve the master. But note a second key mark of this man, along with being self-denying. Barnabas was sacrificial. He was sacrificial as he served Christ and his people. In chapter 4, we're told how all the believers were one in heart and mind. They shared their possessions, so nobody was left in need. There were those who sold their houses and brought the money from the sales to the apostles, and it was given to those in greatest need. Well, Barnabas was a contributor to this relief fund. Barnabas sold a field that he owned, and he placed the revenue before the apostles. Why was Barnabas so generous? He no longer lived for himself. He now lived for Christ, and he loved his fellow believers. So he was willing to sacrifice to help those in need. Even though it cost him much, he was ready to give this really large gift. And he not only sacrificed financially in Christ's service, he willingly sacrificed his time to serve his brothers and sisters in Christ and to spread the gospel. In Acts 11, Barnabas was willing to leave the church in Jerusalem to go to Antioch. He was ready to make that long journey and to spend time with the new believers there. And he ministered to the new Christians in Antioch, strengthening them, encouraging them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. This was demanding service, friends, but Barnabas was totally up for it. And then in Acts 13, Barnabas and Paul were sent out on their first missionary journey by the church in Jerusalem, or the church in Antioch. And once again, much sacrifice was involved in this service. Anyone involved in any type of gospel ministry or mission endeavor will testify to how costly it can be. Missionary work requires considerable sacrifice. But Barnabas was up for this. Barnabas was prepared for long boat journeys. He was ready for trekking across land. Barnabas was willing to face opposition and hostility. Barnabas was prepared to move out of his comfort zone and to step into the unknown for the sake of the gospel. For Barnabas was devoted to Christ, his church and his mission. What about you, my friend? Are you being a Barnabas? Are you sacrificial in how you live for the Lord? Does your service for your Saviour cost you? Financially, do you give cheerfully and sacrificially to Christ's ministry and mission? Time-wise, are you willing to give of your time to serve Christ and to help others? What about your holidays? Are you prepared to use part of them to serve on a mission team? And in spreading the gospel, are you prepared to step out of your comfort zone? Are you prepared to be in the receiving end of indifference or apathy as you seek to reach out to people or even hostility? Jesus spells out how we must be ready for sacrifice. In Mark 8, 35, Jesus said, Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Jesus Christ himself was willing to lose his life and to suffer rejection and hostility and even the horror of hell for us. Plainly, we too must be prepared for costly service and to suffer shame, pain and persecution. Barnabas was. He was sacrificial. A third key mark of this man as God's servant was that Barnabas was self-effacing. I love this about Barnabas. He was self-effacing. He was a humble guy. 
He did not seek the limelight. He didn't push himself forward, for he didn't think too highly of himself. He recognized his gifts, he was willing to use them, but he didn't think he could do it all himself. He wasn't a one-man band, he was a team person. He was very aware of his need for the help of others. When he arrived in Antioch, he saw all these new converts and how they needed to be taught and discipled. And so what did he do? He didn't try to do it all by himself. He headed off to Tarsus to look for Paul, and he brought Paul back to Antioch. Barnabas knew that Paul, as a great teacher, would be a wonderful blessing to the new disciples. And so he asked Paul to be his partner in the gospel. And Barnabas wasn't afraid of being upstaged by Paul. He wasn't concerned that Paul would become the most prominent one in the partnership. No, Barnabas really wanted the Lord to use Paul greatly in helping the early believers. Plainly, Barnabas wasn't out for his own glory or to establish his own little kingdom and group. He was self-effacing. All that mattered to this guy was the glory of King Jesus and his kingdom being advanced. Such an attitude is essential in church life. No one apart from Jesus should be at the centre of attention in church. And when the Lord uses our fellow believers with their gifts, we should rejoice and give thanks for them. There's to be no rivalry or competition in Christ's kingdom and church. There's to be no jealousy amongst Jesus' followers. The life of a true servant of Christ is a life of humility. Being a servant of God isn't primarily a matter of activity. Primarily, it's a matter of attitude, a humble attitude. Self-importance is the curse of the Christian church. The more important someone considers himself to be in the church, the less use he is in Christ's service. For whenever there is a loss of humility, there's a loss of power. But when a believer says, Oh Lord, I'm weak. Christ responds, When you're weak, then you're strong. Because I'll be your strength. And I have all power. Therefore, humility is key in Christian service. What about you, my friend? Are you being a Barnabas in this way? Do you walk closely with Christ, aware of your weakness, depending on his power to work in you and through you? Are you abiding in Christ, relying upon him? And are you concerned first and foremost for his glory? Or are you trying to grab some of the glory for yourself? Are you pushing yourself forward, seeking the praise of man? Friends, don't be a Diotrephes. In the Bible, Diotrephes was strongly condemned. For John declared in the third letter that Diotrephes loved to be first. Diotrephes sought the limelight. In his little congregation, Diotrephes wanted to be the kingpin. Diotrephes thought that he was the top guy. Don't be a Diotrephes. Be a Barnabas. A fourth and final mark of this man is that Barnabas was supportive. As a servant of God, he was supportive of his fellow believers. Indeed, he really stands out in the New Testament as a believer who got alongside other believers to help them. Clearly, he was given the name Barnabas for good reason, because Barnabas means son of encouragement. And that's exactly what he was, a real encourager. He was a tremendous blessing to his brothers in Christ. His love for the Lord and God's people, it radiated out. His enthusiasm for the things of Christ was clearly infectious. In chapter 4, he encouraged his fellow believers with his generosity and love for them. In chapter 9, he got alongside Saul shortly after his surprising conversion and brought him in to the rest of the group, having heard his testimony. They were all scared. Barnabas stepped out and went to Saul and brought him to the apostles and gave him the chance to testify about the Lord's grace to him. In chapter 11, Barnabas went to the new converts in Antioch and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now, in chapter 15, Barnabas had a big disagreement with Paul and they went their separate ways. 
Their disagreement was over John Mark, who had let them both down on their first missionary journey when he'd gone back home. It seemed to be all too much for John Mark at that stage. Perhaps he'd got homesick or found it all too demanding. Well, in Acts 15, Barnabas wanted to give John Mark a second chance and to take him along again, but Paul didn't think it was wise. And so Paul and Barnabas had this disagreement and they separated. Paul went off with Silas, Barnabas took on John Mark. Well, as a result, because of Barnabas' support, John Mark grew as a faithful, fruitful servant of Christ. And Paul, later in his life, acknowledged that. Where would John Mark have been without Barnabas and his encouragement? So friends, here is a man who was a tremendous support to his fellow believers, to those in particular need, to new converts, even those with a really bad past like Saul, and to those who had failed, like John Mark. Well, every servant of Christ is to be like Barnabas in this way. We're all called to support each other. We're all to stand with those in particular need. We're to strengthen and to help those who are new in the faith, whatever their background, and we're to help to restore those who failed publicly. How are you responding to this call? Are you seeking to encourage your fellow believers in their service for Christ? Could you be described as a supportive person and follower of Jesus? Could you indeed be called a son or daughter of encouragement? To be an encourager is not optional. It's your calling and mine. Our Lord commands us, encourage one another and build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 And so this is your responsibility and mine, to be a servant of God like Barnabas, to be supportive, self-effacing, sacrificial and self-denying. May the Spirit of Christ so help us to be such Christ-like servants. Let us join in prayer together. O oh God in heaven, we praise you for the examples you give us in Scripture and throughout church history of men and women who have lived as true, faithful, fruitful servants of Christ. We pray that you will help us to learn especially this evening from the example of Barnabas. He was born in sin. He was a sinner by nature and practice like us, and yet you transformed him to be a Christ-like servant. And we pray that you will do likewise in all of our lives, whatever stage of life we're at. We pray that your gospel and spirit will be at work in each of our hearts and minds, bringing about that inner transformation, that humbling, that attitude that we need to have, recognizing how unworthy we are to be servants of God, how much Jesus has done to make us servants of God. How privileged we are to be servants of the Most High in this day and generation in which you've placed us. And enable us, O God, to be those who are denying ourselves day by day, who are saying no to sin and fleeing from temptations, who are saying yes to what you command in your word and to costly service. Help us to be willing for sacrifice to step out of our comfort zones, to reach out to those who are lost and perishing all around us in their sin on the broad road to hell. Help us, O God, to be self-effacing, not to be seeking the limelight in any way or the glory for ourselves. Give us a greater passion still for the glory of King Jesus, our Saviour, and for the advancement of his kingdom and the building up of his church. And Father, help us to be supportive of one another we all struggle so much in our Christian lives to live as Christ has called us to live, to reflect his likeness in our homes, amongst our friends, in our schools and colleges and workplaces, and in the church, your bride. We struggle, O oh God, help us to grow, to be more and more like Barnabas, and so to be growing more and more like Christ. Father, we thank you for each other. We thank you for the blessing of our fellowship together. We pray that as you 
Lead us out into this new week that you will help us to walk closely with our Saviour and to be his ambassadors. Father, we commend into your hands tonight those new pastors in our denomination. We thank you for your calling upon their lives to serve you in this way. We pray for John and Deborah and Daniel as they begin family life and service in Drumbalg. We pray that John will soon recover from COVID, that you will grant further encouragements and help in all the responsibilities he's taken on. We pray this too for Paul and Elaine and their family, having moved to Brady to serve you there. Grant Paul much wisdom and encouragement as he begins his ministry in the Northwest. We pray that the light of the gospel will shine brightly in that part of our country, which has known such spiritual darkness in past generations. We pray that many will be brought from darkness to light through the work and witness of your people there. Father, we thank you for Paul Flynn and for how you've enabled him to complete his training and his placements and for the blessing you've made him. And we pray that you will open up before Paul and his family your way for them as they wait upon you. We pray that they'll be blessed with your peace and your patience and a deep sense of your presence with them day by day. Father, we commend Kenny Stevenson and Johnny Fitzsimmons to you as well in their placements over these weeks of the summer as they begin to prepare for their Hebrew in the autumn and do their summer reading in the demands of all their family life. We pray that you will uphold our brothers, that you will strengthen them and their families, that you will provide for all of their needs. You know their situations and we pray that you will be God, Jehovah Jireh, their provider. And we pray that you will raise up many more to train as pastors and mission workers in our denomination, in gospel ministry and mission. Oh God, lay this vital work upon the hearts of men whom you will call and guide into training and service. And Father, we pray not only for you to raise up godly leaders within our denomination, but also in our land, that you will raise up godly leaders who will govern wisely in the assembly, who will seek to lead the people of our country in the ways of King Jesus, who will be humble before you, recognizing their accountability to you, walking in the fear of God. And we pray that you would give us such leaders, O oh God, in a time of great need in the life of our country. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and for his honour alone. Amen.